Good morning. I'm Kim McClary, President and CEO of the Los Angeles World Affairs Council and Town Hall. Thank you all for joining us. I want to thank all of you for your ongoing support of the Council Town Hall through your contributions, by becoming members, and renewing your memberships. The need for our informed, nonpartisan discussions is more critical than ever before. We hope to bring back our very popular in-person programs just as soon as we can do so safely. In the meantime, we are providing these live streams for free as a public service, which is why we can't do this without your support. Please visit our website at lawac.org to see how you can support our mission so that we can continue to provide you with the quality programming like today. It is now my pleasure to introduce today's program with Brazilian Ambassador to the United States, His Excellency Nestor Forster, who will be discussing his vision for the future of the US-Brazil relationship and how Brazil is responding to the COVID-19 pandemic. Today's program will be moderated by Professor Carol Wise, Political Science and International Relations at the University of Southern California. For those of you who are joining us online, we will be taking questions in about 20 minutes. There's a control panel on the right-hand side of your screen where you can type in your questions. Jessica Deganzik, our Vice President of events, will, of events, will be managing your questions during the Q&A portion of today's program. And we'll do our very best to get to as many of your questions as possible. Thank you for joining us. And now, Professor Wise, it's time for me to turn the program over to you. Thank you so much for moderating. It is my pleasure. I am so really honored to be here with you, Ambassador. We have a packed uh, program. We have a lot of important questions. And I want to begin by asking you about the US-Brazil relationship. And because time is tight, I'd like you to segue, if you could, uh, into the California-Brazil relationship because of the space program and the agreement that was recently signed between Brazil and California. Thank you very much, Professor Wise. Let me just begin by thanking the World Affairs Council of Los Angeles, uh, Kim McCleary and uh, Jessica and the whole team there for hosting me. I also want to thank my colleague, Ambassador Marcia Loreiro, our Consul General in Los Angeles and her whole team for uh, helping us uh, organize uh, this event today. So let me be in, uh, begin from uh, the beginning. Uh, we, we can say, we know without exaggeration that Brazil-US relations uh, are currently in their highest point uh, they ever been for a very long time. There are several reasons for that and there are several exciting things uh, happening. I'll try to mention some of them and I'll try also to plug in for uh, you know the specific interest of the great state of California and its businesses in the, in the relationship with, with Brazil. Let me just uh, begin by saying that Brazil and the United States have the longest standing relationship of any other country. Brazil has uh, uh, diplomatic relations if in the world. Just in about three years, we're gonna be celebrating two centuries of diplomatic relations during which we have developed you know, a, a tremendous uh, friendship. And uh, we have uh, brought together uh, many uh, values and principles which we share. Uh, Brazil, for instance, inspired itself very much in the American Constitution when we drafted our first Republican Constitution back in 1891. Uh, we uh, used the same model of a federation uh, uh, and a republic to organize our state in Brazil, and that's still standing. Uh, we also fought uh, alongside with U.S. troops during World War II against the Nazi fascism in, in Europe. So we also went to, to, to battles together. Uh, more recently, you know, many exciting things have been going on. And uh, at the current moment, we have a, a tremendous relationship between the two heads of state, between uh, President Trump and President Bolsonaro. And that, of course, helps make, uh, uh, bring, uh, you know, to fruition uh, these uh, shared principles. Uh, when I, I, when I uh, refer to shared principles, I'm talking about, uh, you know, respect for democracy, the rule of law, for human rights and individual freedoms. Uh, there's a whole host of very fundamental values that Brazil and the United States share that enable us to go forward together in many areas. Now, when we have uh, the two heads of state having this uh, very, very positive uh, conversions of views, uh, it enables us to do even more. 
Uh, let me just highlight what we've been doing since uh, President Bolsonaro came uh, in his first official, official visit to the United States in March last year. There was a turning point in our relations and uh, we signed many agreements, many important things were done. Uh, for instance, the United States welcomed Brazil as a major non-NATO ally, you know, in the whole military defense area. We are also able to sign uh, what's called the Technological Safeguards Agreement, and that bears with, uh, with the interest of Professor Wise that you mentioned of California, because that opens up the possibility of American companies participating in the launching of satellites in the, the base we have in northeastern Brazil, the city of Alcantara, which is, uh, some people say, it's the best place in the world to launch satellites. I'll come back to, to that uh, in a second. During that visit, we also had, you know, the United States fully supporting Brazil's bid to access to join the OECD, uh, which is something uh, very important for us in the whole process of economic reform that's being led by our Minister of the Economy, Paulo Guedes, trying to reduce the cost of doing business in Brazil modernize the Brazilian economy, open up the country, expose our industries to competition and to, in, you know, to, to investment so we can modernize and, and compete better. Uh, that's uh, all part of a, of a package. But we've been, been doing much more since, uh, since uh, uh, the beginning of this year, uh, when the presidents met again in Mar-a-Lago in Florida in early March, uh, a whole vision uh, came out of that meeting uh, whereby uh, the presidents asked us to uh, try to, to forge by the end of this year, you know, a significant package in the trade and economic realm. And we've been working very hard on, on just that. Let me just add a personal note, if I may. Uh, I, had, uh, I got the COVID-19 right there at uh, Mar-a-Lago, right after that. And uh, I was very much concerned that, you know, my case is very mild. I should add, I recovered in just a week. Uh, I was very lucky, very fortunate. Uh, but uh, we had this, you know, the tremendous challenge of trying to keep the momentum of this agenda that was going on in several fronts: trade, economic, defense, uh, military, science, technology. I can elaborate more on that uh, later on. And uh, and then we had a pandemic. And uh, I, I, you know, I, I had the, my doubts whether we would be able to continue with this very dynamic relationship amidst, uh, uh, you know, a global pandemic. And I'm glad to report that we have uh, managed to do just so. The, um, the amount of uh, meetings and concrete things we've been doing in this past three months are really, uh, you know, for me, were more than I, uh, one could expect. Uh, we've been mo moving forward on the trade and economic uh, front, uh, as I mentioned. Uh, we have uh, uh, some deals being negotiated of trade facilitation, of e-commerce, of, in the area of good regulatory practices between our countries. We have the, the CEO forum, a private sector forum, which will meet again uh, on the second semester of this year. We had uh, just recently an edition of the commercial dialogue uh, between the two countries, getting senior officers from, from uh, both sides. We had 100 people participating. So that's, I would say that's an upside of the, the whole effort of the, trying to do the work uh, virtually is that you can bring more people into the room sometimes. There are things that we miss, and of course we, we miss dearly, you know, the physical presence, being able to do things that diplomats do in terms of, you know, having cocktail parties, receptions, working lunches, uh, cultural events, and so on. But there's also uh, an upside, if we can say so, uh, of, uh, you know, using more, more technology, getting more people. So we had this uh, commercial dialogue, which also bared some, uh, borne some good fruit uh, towards uh, having this package, the economic and trade package, by, by the end of the year. The idea that is that that will pave the way for a more intense, for deepening our bilateral uh, relationship in, in, the, in the trade and, and commercial uh, area. Uh, just uh, uh, if I can go specifically about, uh, you asked about California. We know that California has a, a great aerospace uh, industry. And uh, we have heard here at the embassy in Washington uh, from uh, many, many companies based there in California, the big ones and not so big ones, which are interested in profiting from uh, what uh, we are now able to do in Alcantara. So uh, we signed this deal last year and uh, the Brazilian Congress approved the deal in, in a very fast pace. It was approved uh, by the end of last year and it came in full, into, in full force last February. And now the Brazilian Space Agency uh, is uh, leading the effort on the Brazilian side 
of bringing all these companies, American companies interested in investing uh, there in Alcantara and finalizing with them the details, you know, agreement, technical details, intellectual property questions, et cetera, to uh, enable them to uh, launch the first satellite. Uh, it's uh, one would hope that, uh, you know, it can be done in one or two years to have the first uh, uh, satellite launched from Alcantara. One of the, the, the special things about Alcantara is that it's situated at two degrees south of the equator, and it can, you can launch a satellite there in any direction, north, south, uh, east, or west. So it, it's, it's, it's very flexible, and it's uh, particularly suited to, for what's called in the industry the nano satellites with small payloads, satellites that perhaps could help us uh, do new things in the area of environmental protection. We just had a major disaster in the Brazilian northeastern coast the last year with uh, foreign vessels dumping oil into the sea. And uh, if we had this uh, base already operating, you know, we could launch a satellite in 48 hours and have a clear picture of what's going on there and uh, perhaps help us uh, take the, the best decisions and enforcement decisions and so on. Uh, of course, it has tremendous use also to monitor what goes on in the Amazon in terms of the annual fires we have and the efforts to preserve the forest uh, and, and so on. So there, there are many possibilities there and Brazil is very much open in terms of a welcoming uh, investment in this uh, very critical sector in which Brazil is taking its first steps you know, in the aerospace industry. We have you know, consolidated a presence in, in this area with uh, Embraer and other smaller Brazilian companies. And uh, we, we are you know, ready to, to work together with uh, our American partners to make that a, a success story. Thank you. From the standpoint of California, the possibility for cross-border production, global value chains, and high-valued uh, uh, technology, it's very exciting, very, very exciting. So question two, um, we have to turn to a sad topic. The, the New, York, New York Times uh, reported this last weekend that the deaths from COVID-19 in Brazil are now really peaking, at, you know, the, up there with the U.S. Uh, and let's just hear a little bit from you, please, about what the government is doing. It is a crisis. It is, Professor Weiss, yes. Uh, look, we've been very serious about fighting the, the pandemic since, uh, you know, it was first identified back in January. Our Ministry of Health already launched a special initiative to tackle the pandemic, making resources available for the, you know, the local administrations and trying to organize nationally our public health system to be able to, to, to face the challenges that we, we knew were coming. Many things were done. Uh, let me just make one point to make it clear that you know, there's a, a, the federal role, the, the federal government plays a limited role in all this. Uh, the courts in Brazil have ruled that uh, much like here in the United States, it's up to the local administrations, you know, state governors, uh, municipalities, to enforce and to determine, you know, the extension of quarantines and, uh, you know, other measures like social distancing, etc. So in Brazil, it's clear that that's up to the governors and, uh, and uh, local administrations to take care of. What's the role of the federal government? The federal government has to provide the resources and set some of the guidelines. And that's something that uh, you know President Bolsonaro has been been very serious about from the outset. Two things that uh, two points he made, which I, I think stand uh, still stand strong. Uh, one, he said, look, if you take a look at the size of Brazil, a country with this uh, you know tremendous regional uh, uh, diversity that you have in Brazil, from the Amazon to the very industrialized south to the wetlands in the middle to the northeast, uh, you cannot have a one size fits all kind of approach. You know, it's a diverse country. Different realities required different approaches. That's one point that, that, that he made. And another thing he said, which uh, seems to have been vindicated, is that even though this is basically mainly a public health emergency, uh, its effects are not only uh, uh, you know, circumscribed to the health realm. We should also bear in mind that there are very serious social and economic consequences of the pandemic. And that what the president has been saying is that we need to, an integrated, a holistic approach in fighting all these fronts together, not one in detriment of the other. And that, that's uh, you know, what the federal government uh, try, is trying to do in Brazil with a tremendous effort from you know, different areas of the government. For instance, the, the Ministry of the Economy has led a tremendous fiscal effort in trying to you know, reduce, alleviate, alleviate the immediate uh, tax burden for, for small businesses, especially uh, for families, especially for the most vulnerable, the poorest Brazilians. 
the president has expressed a concern with those so in the so-called informal sector, people you know who, who don't have a you know a, a regular paycheck who have to wake up in the morning and win their bread every day. If they are locked uh, in, a, in a situation of lockdown, they have uh, you know it, it, it's very hard for these people to 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 bring uh, you know food for their families. So uh, you know the president recommended some flexibility in that. In uh, what we did also was direct cash transfer programs for these people, and uh, it's been a very successful and it has even been praised by by institutions such as the World Bank and the IMF as uh, the way to approach, you know, putting money directly into the hands of those uh, who need it the most. Uh, you know, the pandemic is still uh, going strong in Brazil because we are, uh, in a way, uh, late in the, in the curve if you compare with the situation in the United States. Brazil is about six weeks behind in, uh, because it started later, you know. And uh, the number of deaths in Brazil, it's very sad, it's over 40,000 now, but it has, it's still less than half what, what happened in the, here in the United States. Uh, in a way, you know, from the pandemic point of view, the situation might get a bit worse before it starts to get better. But we are confident that, you know, with everything that's being done on the ground and all the resources made available uh, for for state governments to to fight the disease in in all, uh, you know, at the local level, that we'll start to to reverse this picture. Let me just add a note here on the bilateral side. We are very thankful for the cooperation we've been having with the uh, government of the United States. Uh, one thing we've been taking part in a in a group that discusses you know new therapies, the vaccines, and you know how to uh, testing new tests, how to fight the disease. It's a group led by the of Office of Science and Technology of, of the White House, and Brazil has been participating in it at a very high level. Our Minister of Science and Technology himself has been taking part in this. That's one thing. Uh, we also had the generous donation of 1,000 ventilators from the United States uh, for you know, our public uh, health system and uh, also of medicines and so on. So we are very thankful for that cooperation and look forward to continue that. We are also working on developing vaccines. There are Brazilian institutions, University of Sao Paulo and Fiocruz, it's a research uh, institute uh, in, in Brazil. Uh, both are working in, uh, in vaccine projects that are still in the, the preclinical phases, but are going forward. And uh, you know, we are sharing the results of, uh, of the scientific work that's being done. Uh, hopefully that, you know, hoping that uh, soon we'll, we'll be able to come, come up with uh, you know, uh, some vaccine. Professor Wise, I think you're muted. Final question. I have always cited Brazil in my own work as a country that has very successfully managed a good relationship with the U.S. and a good relationship with China. You benefited greatly from the U.S.-China trade war with the massive sale of soybeans uh, to China uh, this last year, I believe the year before also. And I'm just wondering, um, you know, the, the global economy is basically shut down now. And when it comes back, what do you envision your relationship with China to be? It is now your top trade partner. In 2009, it became. So what is that relationship looking like? And uh, moving forward, how is COVID-19 affecting trade, soybeans and all of this? Thank you very much for that question, Professor Weiss. Considering your upcoming, uh, upcoming book on China, I, I fear you, you might ask exactly about that. Uh, <laughs> look, Brazil has a very solid uh, relationship uh, with China. Uh, it's become our number one trading partner uh, overall. Uh, the U.S. is still the largest market for Brazilian uh, manufactured goods, but we export a lot of uh, agriculture and raw materials to, to China. We also have a very uh, important investment relationship. There are important Chinese investments especially in, in some infrastructure uh, projects in Brazil, which, which are very much uh, welcome. Uh, that relation, you know, uh, we hope it will continue to go strong. Uh, our trade, if we look into the uh, figures for the, the first quarter of this year, uh, our, our exports to China and to Asia in general have grown significantly, even amidst the, the pandemic. And uh, it is our hope if we look at into the trends of uh, you know what's going on in China. I'm no expert, but uh, you know from the information I have, 
one thing that might come as a result of uh, you know possible decoupling in some uh, some sectors or you know reorganization of supply chains might be a, a renewed emphasis uh, from uh, the Chinese on their own domestic market uh, you know uh, expanding their domestic market incorporating more people into the market and so on and uh, that might open many opportunities for increased Brazilian exports including you know of a uh, uh, of uh, manufactured goods uh, down in, in the future. Uh, also, let me point out what you asked me about the, the you know possible scenarios for the post-pandemic world and so on. Uh, one thing that uh, might be but might be interesting with uh, relation to China and the United States is you know considering what we I was just mentioning the, the re reorientation reorganization of some of the supply chains. Uh, I'd say that Brazil might be in a, in a very favorable position. To attract at least some of, of those investments, if we consider, you know, the the, the very uh, strong push for reform, economic reform in Brazil, which should continue strong and even stronger, with uh, as a result of you know the public health crisis, uh, Minister Gadges himself has recently said that you know this should not be uh, used as an excuse to 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 procrastinate, but uh, to 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 accelerate the the process of reforms and. You know, people in Congress have supported uh, this idea. So we, uh, we hope we can move forward with the tax reform by the end of this year, the administrative reform that's also uh, coming up in Brazil. If you, you know, look at the effects of the, uh, that reform and those that have been already undertaken, the law of economic freedom, the pension, the public uh, system of uh, public pensions that was reformed last year, the resources that have been freed, and uh, this overall effort of reducing the cost of doing business in Brazil with our accession to the OECD, with the great uh, trade agreement we negotiated with the European Union last year, we wrapped up 20 years of negotiations. It's the largest regional trade agreement ever negotiated. It will be coming into force in the coming years. And you know we have a, this strong and ongoing, uh, uh, increasing uh, relationship with the United States. Uh, I think those all, all that points to a, a convergence, uh, making Brazil uh, perhaps a very attractive place to 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 receive some of the investments that uh, might be uh, reoriented uh, after after the pandemic. Yes, I couldn't agree with you more. Okay, a final question. I'm sure some in our audience are wondering about this: is uh, the protection of the Amazon and government policies toward the Amazon? Yeah, that's you know that's a it's a foremost uh, concern for many people around the world. Let me tell you, it's a big concern for Brazilians, for the government, for the for the federal government itself. So uh, you know, there's some uh, misinformation that it might be useful to to correct for the record. You know, on what we've been doing on the Amazon. Last year we had a big outcry about fires fires in the Amazon, and those take place uh, every single year. And it's not the forest burning, it's areas that have been deforested before in the fringe of, of, of the ecosystem that we call the, the Amazon. And uh, you know that's something that uh, happens every year. Those are primitive techniques used by some in, some in agriculture. But the government has been doing is trying to reduce, to control that, which of course is always a challenging task. But uh, the, the, the Bolsonaro administration did something very uh, uh, totally unprecedented. It invoked the possibility, what's called in the Brazilian constitution as the guarantee of law and order. And it invoked this for environmental purposes. It did it last year. It was renewed just uh, a month ago for another year. And this basically enables the federal government to use federal troops, uh, army troops on the ground to fight illegal deforestation, to fight illegal fires, to fight criminal activity going on in the Amazon, you know, uh, uh, helping the, inst the institutions we have uh, for environmental protection. It's unprecedented what's been done. Last year we had 43,000 troops involved in these operations called Green Brazil One, uh, Operação Verde Brasil. We had 25 firemen fighting on the ground. You know, uh, millions of dollars in fines were applied. Many camps in, of illegal activities were destroyed. Thousands of cubic meters of illegal timber were apprehended and so on. So there are concrete results to show how seriously we're taking this, you know, without without uh, falling into, you know, a, a rosy scenario, propaganda scenario that, you know, uh, that all, all is perfect. Uh, we have challenges, we recognize that, 
And the main thing to bear in mind when we talk about the Amazon is that the Amazon is not just a fantastic environment, a unique uh, a rainforest in the world, the largest one, etc., which we very much want to preserve, and we've done a, a good job so far of, of, uh, of uh, preserving it. It's, uh, it, it's also uh, where 25 million Brazilians live. So this is perhaps where some uh, uh, misinformation, misinterpretation has been taking place. Is when the president says that he wants to bring opportunity for these people, he's not talking about destroying the environment to, to bring up economic opportunity. He's very much stepping head on the very idea of uh, sustainable development. You know, uh, people want to talk about the sustainability part of it, but you know, you cannot forget the development, the economic uh, uh, development uh, side of it. Things go together hand in hand. So it's thinking about those 25 million Brazilians who have some of the lower social development indexes in all our country that we need to you know, be creative and bring environmentally sustainable solutions that will both generate opportunity, growth, jobs for these people, and also protect the environment. Thank you so much. I'm going to turn this over to Jessica, who is going to moderate questions from the audience. Thank you so much. We're getting a lot of questions in. Um, I will just start right away. Uh, what is the sentiment of Brazilians towards President Bolsonaro, especially around his response to COVID-19 and letting his health minister resign? Well, you know, it's up, the, the president nominates, I mean, the health minister and, and uh, has the, the, the possibility of firing them. Uh, the, the Ministry of Health has been doing a work, a very professional work that's been recognized even by international authorities, as, as I, I mentioned in, in passing before. Uh, you know, there's a, a great support in Brazil for President Bolsonaro. And uh, as, as you had here in the United States, there might be some, some tension sometimes between the different levels of government, which is very typical of a federation. You know, the state governor uh, decides to do one thing. There are federal guidelines pointing in a different direction. That's why uh, the Supreme Court was called to intervene in Brazil, to intervene, to, to issue a, a ruling saying, you know, making clear what's the role of, of uh, different, the different levels uh, of government. The federal government has distributed more than 10 million tests around the country, has provided the resources to the state governments to fight the disease. Of course, you know, this is a tough situation, a big challenge for all public authorities. And, uh, you know, we keep fighting and eventually it will, will prevail. Thank you. How much independence do governors and mayors have to respond to COVID independently of what the president thinks? Well, they have total independence, as I said. I mean, in, in terms of uh, enforcement measures of, uh, you know, defining exactly uh, what the approach will be, how long will quarantine uh, uh, last, uh, you know, the extents of uh, lockdowns, what are essential business? I mean, essential businesses in Brazil are defined by federal law. So the discussion there is already limited and there are 57 uh, sectors already identified. It's a, it's a generous law. Uh, so that, that's done by, by law and it's been in place for, for many years. Now the governors and uh, you know, the uh, mayors in, in municipalities, they have the resources, the, the, the financial resources have been made available. Nobody's complaining about that. And uh, they can pursue different policies. And uh, you know, if you look at, at what's going on in Brazil, you see different results, more successful policies in one place. And, and, a little bit less successful in others. There are challenges that many, many areas uh, share. If you look, for instance, at where the most cases are in Brazil, there's still a concentration in the, in the, the largest cities, especially Sao Paulo and Rio, which account for almost half, it's 45% of uh, the number of cases and, and, and deaths that we have in Brazil. It's a situation a little bit comparable to what happened in the US in, with uh, New York City, you know? Uh, a, a big urban center having uh, the, the most cases at, at one point. And, uh, but, uh, you know, the important thing is that, uh, that the measures are being taken at, at, at all levels of government. And we are confident that eventually we will overturn it. There's a, the disease has its own rhythm. And it, as I said, it might get a bit worse before it starts to get really better. And we'll hope that uh, that will be very soon. Thank you. Um, this questioner asks, I uh, say it's the way you describe the Brazilian response to COVID does not comport with what is published in the American press, which describes the response as ignoring the problem. The Washington Post today published an article um, as Bolsonaro, Bolsonaro dismissing the threat as a measly cold. Can you please expand on this discrepancy? Well, you know, people, uh, the press sometimes portrays, uh, you know, the things from one point of view or not the other. 
uh, what I'm saying here is, you know, I'm, I'm basing what I'm saying here in public information and, uh, you know, the real data on the ground. And uh, uh, if, if the president said, you know, or, or some uh, health authority said it, didn't think it was so serious uh, some months ago, I haven't heard anybody saying any of that uh, recently. It's very seriously serious and it's been uh, faced seriously uh, by Brazil, you know. The, the press is free to publish whatever it wants. The situation on the ground is, is what it is. Thank you. Are you getting support from the international community to address the Brazilian COVID crisis? And are your healthcare facilities able to handle the influx in cases? Well, a very good question. Yes, there's a tremendous level of co cooperation. I mentioned the cooperation with the United States. It's an ongoing effort and has been there from, uh, from the outset. We're also cooperation, uh, cooperating with other countries in, in, in South America and uh, with uh, different uh, international organizations that, uh, that might help us. That's all, that's all very welcome. Uh, in Brazil, as I mentioned uh, in the beginning, uh, you know, we have differences among the regions. So we have a national public health system that reaches every single Brazilian city, but it doesn't reach every, every single city in the same way. It's, it's very hard to, to do that. You know, as, uh, as I said, uh, areas that concentrate more people, big urban centers have, you know, better facilities, better hospitals are, are better equipped. If you, if you look at the, the raw data of the number of intensive care units available in Brazil, it's, uh, you know, it's per 1,000, 100,000 uh, inhabitants. It's larger than many European more advanced uh, economies. Uh, the thing is in Brazil that, you know, they tend to be concentrated in the, the, the wealthiest parts of the country. So that's also uh, presents uh, some specific challenges. Thank you. Um, this also might be one for Professor Weiss. She might have some insight. Um, has it been decided Brazil's decision on the 5G program? Will China be excluded? <laughs> Professor Weiss, you have to go first. No, you're the, yeah. you're the I mean, no. I have my views on this, yes. Yeah. There is an ongoing discussion about about uh, in Brazil about uh, the infrastructure for 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 5G. Yeah. Uh, everybody's uh, very conscious of the importance of uh, the decision and regulations for this area for the future of the economy. You know, 5G will bring us the Internet of Things, will bring uses we cannot even think about in terms of uh, telemedicine, of perhaps reaching those most remote areas that I was alluding to in my previous uh, answer. Uh, you know, the remote areas of the country where you don't have a very strong uh, institutional presence of, uh, of, uh, of the health system. Uh, telemedicine, uh, Internet of Things, I mean, uh, uh, making things uh, go around uh, instantaneously and so on. It's a tremendous, tremendous potential. Uh, we have been careful drafting the guidelines that will rule that. Uh, I'm, not, uh, I'm not aware that any, anything has been decided as to inclusions or exclusions. There are things that need to be taken into account, and I think they, they will be in terms of, you know, the technology, the financial aspects of this, but, you know, that does not uh, uh, finalize the matter. There are also other concerns in terms of security, of safety, you know, uh, I'd say it's not an exaggeration if you say that 5G will be part of the so-called critical infrastructure of a country, you know, we, we think about power generation, we think about things like that, and uh, you know, uh, nuclear facilities, uh, f uh, the 5G uh, network itself will be part of the critical uh, infrastructure of, of, of any country. And uh, it, it should be uh, regulated with utmost care to ensure that the level of safety uh, required by, by the citizens in a country you know, the size of Brazil. I will follow up on that and say that uh, I wanna re reiterate, um, Brazil has handled China and Chinese investment, Chinese entry into the Brazilian market better than any other country in the region. There's transparency, there's competitive bidding, there's regulatory oversight. And if any country is in a position to do a deal with Huawei and uh, move with the 5G, it's Brazil. They move very, very cautiously. And I do see a lot of modern legal uh, structures and institutions. I think if they want to do it, they're ready for it. Great. Thank you so much. Uh, with Brazilian debt potentially reaching 100% of GDP by the end of the year due to the COVID-related effects, how can the U.S. and Brazil work together to help Brazil navigate a potential debt crisis during a global economic crisis? 
look, I, I don't have a crystal ball and uh, I'm not a, a, an economist. What I can tell you is that, you know, nobody is envisioning uh, a debt crisis. The measures that we have taken so far have been described by the Ministry of the Economy himself as wartime measures, temporary measures, you know, aimed at addressing a very drastic uh, an emergency situation with the serious, seriousness that it requires. That does not mean that Brazil has, uh, the federal government in Brazil, you know, has turned its back on fiscal discipline and uh, with, uh, you know, the larger goal of continued economic reform. As I said before, some people might say that, you know, this is a good excuse now to, you know, relax uh, fiscal disciplines and, uh, you know, backtrack on reform. Much to the contrary, you know, the leadership in, you know, in the government and also in the political realm, in Congress, and, and in the private sector are fully supporting that uh, in no way we should backtrack, much to the contrary. You know, the, some of the inefficiencies we are seeing in the reaction of the Brazilian industry, of our capacity to bring in back businesses as, as fast as we would like, are inefficiencies built in the cost of doing businesses in Brazil. And this is what we need to update, modernize, streamline, you know, in order to reduce the cost of investing in, in Brazil, bring more economic growth, prosperity, opportunity for, for all Brazilians. Thank you. Uh, just to follow up on that, what upcoming U.S.-Brazil trade developments can be expected? Well, we have several exciting things going on in this realm. Uh, right now, we have conversations ongoing in areas that uh, when, we, when you first look at it, they don't look very glamorous. You know, when you talk about trade facilitation, good regulatory practices, uh, you know, e-commerce is more <laughs> is more glamorous, but still, it, these seems like secondary issues which don't have a big impact. Now, uh, I'm sure that the members of the council who are with us uh, uh, this morning, they know firsthand, and you know, private sector in general knows that this, uh, uh, the removal of non-tariff barriers that you do by, by trade facilitation measures, you know, streamlining the, the operations, the logistics of uh, export and import operations between the two countries, harmonizing regulations in that area, bringing greater transparency, eliminating paperwork and using, you know, electronic, fi electronic filing for everything you can. Uh, you know, those sorts of single uh, uh, window for, for, for companies uh, at uh, the federal uh, government and so on. If you put those things together, they amount to reducing costs, concrete costs of, of doing business. They are very much welcomed by the private sector. There's a study by the World Bank and uh, UNCTAD, I think, that says that uh, you know, the elimination of non-tariff barriers can amount to, to anything between 12 and 20% of tariff equivalents, uh, uh, if, you know, if, if we were talking about tariffs. So there is a concrete impact in terms of uh, the cost of doing business of the facility, cutting red tape, increasing transparency, sometimes eliminating corruption. You know, all this is our, our very, very much welcome uh, developments. We have ongoing negotiations with that. I can tell you that they are pretty advanced in the, the trade facilitation area. Uh, discussions on the e-commerce uh, are going very well too. You know, there are some complex issues involved, but we intend to, to move forward. Uh, the, the issue of uh, re regulation and, you know, what would be good regulatory practices, this is of paramount importance. We are very much uh, uh, interested in, in, in pushing this forward. It's a big challenge for Brazil. It's harder for us to do that uh, uh, among the many agencies and the many levels of government than to negotiate a specific uh, set of uh, rules uh, w with the United States. So this is the challenge we have right now is try to, to, to broaden, let's say, the coalition to make sure that once we have an agreement, it will be fully enforced and it will bring benefits to, you know, Brazilians and, and, uh, and Americans uh, as well. Thank you so much. Uh, this one is from Ambassador Loero here, our Consul General here in Los Angeles. She says, many thanks to LAWAC for offering us this opportunity to exchange ideas, Ambassador Forrester. For the benefit of the audience, I would like to ask you to elaborate a little more on a very important mechanism, which is the CEO Forum. For instance, its purposes, how it works, and how an interested CEO can obtain additional information. Thank you. Very good. Excellent question. Thank you, Ambassador Loreo. Uh, the CEO Forum was a mechanism created many years ago, and it had been dormant for the past five years. Uh, nothing was done. 
Uh, it's comprised of 10 CEOs of big companies from both countries, 10 from each side, 10 American, 10 Brazilian. There is a process for uh, choosing uh, those CEOs. The American side has its rules, we have our own. The important thing is that we are able, last November, for the first time in five years, we're able to get these people together. And what is their role? What, what's the purpose of this forum? The purpose is to bring the private sector inputs into government discussion, especially specifically in the you know the trade and economic realm. So uh, one of the things that uh, the, the CEO forum has been pushing for a double taxation agreement between Brazil and the United States. That's something that we are working on. We've been working for for perhaps too 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 long a time, and uh, we expect that as soon as we we wrap up tax reform in Brazil domestically, we'll be able to tackle this uh, this head on. They have also other uh, excellent suggestions, but one thing that's been implemented with the leadership of the CEO Forum is what's called the Global Entry Program, which is a program that allows uh, you know, Brazilian frequent travelers, not only businessmen, you know, frequent travelers, university professors, people who, who travel a lot between countries, to have you know, an expedited uh, entry process here in the United States. We have a pilot program going on. Uh, and it should be uh, uh, we should be able to expand it soon as soon as you know uh, as soon as uh, air travel is, is uh, resumed. There are other programs. Many of these things I mentioned here in terms of trade facilitation, etc., have been recommended by the CEO forum and by the by the private sector. During the past few weeks, we had uh, already meetings preparing for the second meeting, which will take place second semester in Brazil. We were hopeful that this could be you know a physical, uh, real meeting. Let's say. It, it might have to be virtual, uh, we, we still, it's not clear yet, but the important thing is that, you know, this will enable us to keep pushing the trade and economic agenda forward, bringing support for the for reform process in Brazil and for us to deepen our bilateral relationship with the United States in this very vital area for both countries. Thank you so much. Um, the next question, I would like to understand the travel ban better, if there's an expectation for this to end. I know residents can still enter the U.S., but I would like to know if F1 visa holders slash Brazilians who are studying in the U.S. can enter the country from Brazil too. Excellent question. I, I wanted to mention that. So the travel restrictions adopted since May 27th here in the United States, they basically bar all air travel from people coming from Brazil, but there are many exceptions. Huh? Uh, these exceptions include permanent residents uh, here in the United States, or so green card holders, uh, you know, um, uh, official businesses from government, uh, diplomatic visas, military visas, uh, people who have relatives here in the United States, you should, you know, people should check the details because it depends on the, how old you are and uh, the degree uh, uh, of, uh, you know, uh, how close you are to your relative, etc. So there are some exceptions. And there, there are also, you know, uh, some exceptions for for some humanitarian cases, and we have been able to to address that. The uh, I think the specific question about the F1 visa, the student visa, I'm not sure uh, exactly if those are exempted. Uh, you know, if you're here, you stay here for the duration of your visa. Uh, if you need to go to Brazil and come back, there might be an issue there. So you, I, I suggest you double check in the list of exceptions that is included in the presidential proclamation. It's pretty straightforward. Let me just make an additional point about that, Jessica, is that the, uh, you know, people talk about this, uh, uh, this measure from the United States, but Brazil did the same thing, the exact same thing, restricting air travel two months before. On March 27th, Brazil barred all foreign travel to Brazil with the usual exceptions, you know, permanent residents, people who have relatives, etc. So there are about the same, uh, same list of exceptions on both sides, and we did it too. The important thing is that these measures are temporary. They are, they are motivated exclusively by public health concerns. It's a way to stop, you know, uh, the propagation of, of the, the, the disease. That's all there is. And once numbers start going down, you know, the measures should be reviewed. One good thing is that the number of flights between Brazil and the United States doesn't seem to have been affected by the measures uh, on both sides. We still have, uh, you know, uh, a considerable number of regular flights coming from, uh, from Texas, from Florida, which is, uh, you know, very important to keep what needs to be moved fast in terms of the, our trade and uh, what's time sensitive uh, in terms of exports and imports, uh, uh, you know, to keep it to keep it moving. Thank you. And as a follow-up to that question, uh, someone was asking about the impact of the loss of tourism 
uh, for people going into Brazil. So can you speak a little bit about that? Yeah, that, that's that's been a disaster, not only for Brazil, but worldwide. Uh, one of the hardest hitting industries have been, you know, transportation industry, the hospitality industry, tourism, hotels, restaurants. It, it's an unmitigated disaster. If you look, you know, uh, we have the numbers, for instance, for transportation, the air travel is down 90 90 percent 90 percent it's starting to, to to come back slowly but you know the bottom line 90 percent reduction it's very drastic it has awful impacts uh, what can we do to help uh, in the case of brazil uh, you know the federal government has been trying to help the small and medium businesses in terms of large businesses you know there are sectoral approaches and there is a, a tremendous availability of liquidity provided by our central bank which was one of the first the financial institutions to react to the pandemic, and in a way that again won high praise around the world for for acting fast and you know acting early and providing a level of liquidity which is un unprecedented. And uh, also you know in terms of the, the fiscal support that the Ministry of the Economy has provided in Brazil, it's equivalent of 10% of our GDP. It's more than any other emerging market has done uh, to provide stimulus to to counteract the, the effects of, of the pandemic. Thank you. Um, will Brazil allow for their IDB to invest in other Mercosur countries? Uh, I'm sorry, for, for their IDB? Yeah, I'm, I'm assuming that's a, an, an international bank. One of the, I don't know if that's the central bank, is that the name for the central bank in Brazil? Uh, yeah, IDB, I, I, might, I might not have heard. IDB is the Inter-American Development Get, uh, Bank. It's uh, located here in Washington, it's a uh, regional institution might be referring to BNDES, the Brazilian National Development Bank. That might be it, right? So the... the Unfortunately, the, I'm not sure they just said IDB, yeah, so I apologize. <laughs> I, I, I assume that that was uh, what the question meant. Look, the, the BNDES was the, has been, uh, you know, revamped to a, large, to a large extent, trying to bring it back to its original uh, uh, mission and then goal of financing the development of uh, the, the areas in Brazil who are in most need. And uh, there were some misuses of the bank in, in past governments. There was, uh, you know, a part of the corruption scandals involved that, including in third countries, uh, which is a, a sad episode, but it's, uh, you know, I'm glad to report that it's been taken care of and that the rules have been changed. I think we are still able to finance projects in other countries, including Mercosur countries. I don't know the extent that, uh, you know, how strict those rules are, to avoid it, to avoid excesses. Thank you so much. Um, this questioner asks or says, Brazil is 20, 124 out of 190 in the World Bank's Ease of Doing Business Index and 170 out of 190 in getting timely permits to open a new business. What is being done to improve these rankings to encourage more foreign investment? Excellent question. That, that question, those very bad rankings, that's the reason why we have embarked in a very serious program of economic reform in Brazil. That's where all these efforts, uh, OECD accession, the trade agreement with the European Union, ongoing discussions, bilateral discussions with the United States, all these comes together in this huge effort to cut red tape, eliminate bureaucracy, inefficiencies, which are built into our system and put Brazil in this very awkward position, you know, a country of tremendous potential, one of the largest economies in the world, most resources, the, you know, uh, agricultural champion of the world. And, uh, you know, it's very hard to do business there. Uh, somebody said before, and I totally agree, that the most important uh, trade agreement, that free trade agreement that Brazil can negotiate it's not with the United States, it's not with China, it's perhaps not even with the European Union, it's with Brazil itself. It's something we need to do. And what I'm saying about our foreign, uh, our, our external agenda here is that these things work in the same direction. There is a convergence there, and you know, the point of convergence is re cutting red tape, reducing the cost of doing business, streamlining, you know, making it easier to invest and, 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 and to, 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 to prosper in, in Brazil. And the, you know the reason for that is obvious. We want to ge generate more economic opportunity for all Brazilians, more employment, and, you know, raise the level of, of our population. And uh, you know, it's uh, everything we're doing uh, in our agenda bilaterally here has uh, has a, a, a tremendous component in, in that effort uh, as well. Thank you. 
Um, this is the conversation we're having in the United States right now. Um, so maybe you could also comment on it in Brazil. Um, what is the status of race relations in Brazil? The status of race relations? Yes. Look, Brazil for, for, uh, uh, you know, uh, for, for many, many years was uh, described as uh, the melting pot, you know, uh, as an example of uh, what some people call racial democracy, etc. We might have, you know, our own challenges, localized challenges uh, here and there. But what Brazil has that is unique is Brazil has a level of, you know, uh, intermarriage of mixing between different races and cultures that you can find in very few people, very few places uh, around the world. And that's not something that's started by government fiat, by a requirement for quotas or this or that. That's part of our history since, you know, colonial times. So that's a, it's a, it's a very good aspect that we have. Brazil is a country of people <coughs> of a mixed, uh, mixed race. <coughs> I'm sorry, uh, of mixed race to, to a large extent. And, you know, that helps uh, harmony, that helps, you know, the people from different races not caring too much about it and caring about things that bring them, bring them together. Thank you. And this will be our final question. Um, if you could choose which next country you could be the Brazilian ambassador to, what would that be and why? Also, are there any countries for which you believe Brazil has not invested enough in developing diplomatic relationships? So where are you headed next and what can Brazil do more? Yeah. Look, I think I, I was uh, pretty straightforward in, in replying to all the questions you put forward. You know, some uh, some uh, uh, more difficult, other less. But th this question, I, I don't know about my future. I'm, I'm concentrated right now in doing the best I can in my current job here. I'm still waiting to be confirmed by the plenary of the Senate in Brazil, which is, you know, is something that needs to be completed. So we're awaiting completion. And uh, once I get that and I present my credentials here, then perhaps it will be time to be thinking about the next uh, the next assignment. Let me just uh, 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 chime in one last thing, Jessica, if you allow me uh, one minute. One thing I, I didn't mention, I think in terms of the reaction, we talked about this, the sectors that were hardest hit by the pandemic, et cetera. Uh, we mentioned the tourism uh, uh, section. Uh, what's very interesting to note about Brazil is one of the largest sectors in our economy, which is the agribusiness sector, uh, seems to be showing tremendous resilience and is growing amidst a crisis and is set to harvest uh, a record, harvest 250 million tons of grains this year. So this is, you know, this is uh, something very positive in the, in the middle of, uh, you know, uh, of many challenges that, that we're facing that I would like to, to, to highlight. As for countries, uh, you know, in, around the world, Brazil has also prided itself in being a, a universalist country in terms of its relations with other nations. We have uh, relationships with virtually every country in the world, uh, you know, uh, bar none, I think at this point. Thank you so much for answering all those questions. That was a rapid fire uh, session, but Professor Wise, I'm gonna turn it back over to you. Thank you, Ambassador. Thank you very much. It's really been a fantastic session. And I think I, I really enjoyed it. I really learned a lot. Are any parting words, any parting thoughts that you'd like to leave with us? Absolutely. You know, in terms of, uh, <clears throat> in terms of the relationship of Brazil and US, I just would like to say, to, to repeat what I heard from both our presence in, in Mar-a-Lago, you know, we are perhaps at the, the, at the point where we have the best relations between Brazil and the United States. And it's my, my firm a desire and I work hard to keep it going uh, exactly uh, that way. And uh, thank you very much, Professor Wise and uh, the World Affairs Council for, for hosting me today. And let us know if you need anything from the embassy here in Washington that you can help you uh, with, you know, investment decisions in Brazil, partnerships in Brazil and so on. Uh, we are here to, to help. Thank you. Well, I wish you the best of luck with your confirmation. Thank you so much. I'm going to turn this back over to Kim now. Thank you, Ambassador and Professor Wise, for a very informative discussion. And our hearts and our thoughts and our prayers go out to the Brazilian people, Ambassador, as you're navigating, as we are, through this very challenging time. So peace and, and be safe. I just wanted to, and so thank you both again so much for your time. I, I just wanted to highlight a couple programs we have this week and next week. and. Um, and let you know how you can register for programs. 
Uh, this Wednesday, we're focusing on race relations during the pandemic with a stellar panel, including Michael Lawson, the president and CEO of the Los Angeles Urban League, Helen Torres, president and CEO of HOPE, Charlie Wu, the board chair of CAUSE, moderated by politics professor Dan Schnur. And on Thursday, uh, Dan will be back with his weekly series, Politics in the Time of Coronavirus. Next week, on June 30th, we have Dr. Richard Haas, President of the Council on Foreign Relations, moderated by Doyle McManus, Washington columnist for the Los Angeles Times. You can register for these programs. Uh, it's on your control panel. Just click on the word uh, handouts and see a full listing. And then go to our website at lawac.org where you can register, make a donation, become a member. Please everybody stay safe, stay informed, and we hope to see you soon. Thank you, Ambassador, Professor Weiss. Thank you so much again. Thank you.